morning. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I, uh, I was getting a little cocky. I thought we had ring your beat uh, this year, but uh, the Lord reminds us that we're not in charge, doesn't he? Well, welcome to our parish mission for Lent. Um, open our hearts to the Lord. Today's our first day. Our uh, theme for today is love scripts, how to read God's handwriting. And we begin our spiritual journey when we recognize that God not only loves us, but is in love with us. And we need to develop the capacity to recognize God's handwriting as he sends his love notes to us every day. Can I invite you to please stand for our opening song, I Am For You, in your worship aid. There is a mountain, there is a sea, there is a wind within our breathing, there is an arm to break every chain, there is a fire in all things living.
Please be seated for a reading from Sacred Scripture. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. You shall say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem. By origin and birth, you belong to the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, your mother a Hittite. As for your blood, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. You were not washed with water or anointed. You were not rubbed with salt are wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye looked on you with pity or compassion to do any of these things for you. Rather, on the day you were born, you were left out in the field, rejected. Then I passed by and saw you struggling in your blood, and I said to you in your blood, Live! I helped you to grow up like a field plant, so that you grew, maturing into a woman with breasts developed and hair grown. But still you were stark naked. I passed by you again and saw that you were now old enough for love. So I spread the corner of my cloak over you to cover your nakedness. I swore an oath to you entered into a covenant with you, oracle of the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water, washed away your blood, and anointed you with oil. I clothed you with an embroidered gown, put leather sandals on your feet. I gave you a fine linen sash and silk robes to wear. I adorned you with jewelry, putting bracelets on your arms, a necklace around your neck, a ring in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, your garments made of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. Fine flour, honey, and olive oil were your food. You were very, very beautiful, fit for royalty. You were renowned among the nations for your beauty, perfected by the splendor I showered on you, oracle of the Lord God. The word of the Lord. Please stand for our responsorial song.
So I'd like to share with you, I mean, a few stories. You might have heard them here and there during my homilies, but it will all come together now in one piece. Um, I don't think there are many experiences more embarrassing and humbling for a priest than to fall down during Mass and hurt yourself. And that's what I did 17 years ago in St. Anne's in Barrington. They had just built a new church, and they had not uh, dedicated it yet, but we were already using it. It was a Saturday in a April, and we had a special Mass, what we call the teaching Mass. So you explain the part of the Mass, then you celebrate the Mass. For our children who were making First Communion and their families, so we had about 500 people in the church in an afternoon on a Saturday. And actually, I was not supposed to celebrate that Mass. My pastor was supposed to do that. We were only two priests. But he had other things, so I told him, I said, you know what, let me do this for you. So he said, okay, thank you, Trudeau, so do that. So if you have been to St. Anne's, the altar is about four or five steps up from the floor. So. Usually I stand at the floor level with people. That's how I celebrate Mass and unless I go up to the altar. But that day, you know, I was putting on the vestments. So I went up and I was showing the children one vestment after the other what each meant. And as I was putting it on, the outer garment, the chasuble, was crooked and I didn't realize. And as I came down and I tripped and I fell down five steps, there was a collective gasp in the church. <laughs> And I looked down and said, oh, I feel like the lady in the commercial. I've fallen down and I can't get up. <laughs> and I looked down, there was a microphone. I said, oh boy, did I see it? say anything? <laughs> At that time, four gentlemen ran up to help me up. And all I, in that time, at that time I was about 30 pounds heavier. And uh, the, all my thought was, Oh, please don't say we need two more guys to lift up this place. <laughs> so anyway, finally they helped me up, made me sit down in a wheelchair, and I continued to celebrate Mass, and I could feel the pain throbbing in my knee. And around offertory, my pastor came because he finished something, then he relieved me. So they took me to a van and drove me to Good Shepherd's Hospital, which is near St. Anne's. So on the way, there were two guys in the van. And one of them looks at me and says, Father Prudhoe, do you know the four guys who rushed up to help you were all doctors, but none of them was useful? I said, what do you mean? He said, the first one was a dermatologist, the second was a urologist, the third was a gynecologist, the fourth was an obstetrician. So he said, Father Prudhoe, they looked at you and said, Father Brito, your skin looks good, you don't have a kidney infection, and you're not pregnant. <laughs> anyway, we went into the hospital emergency, they looked at my knee, took x-rays, and they said, tomorrow you should see an orthopedic surgeon. So I went to see him, and he said, you have to have surgery. I had torn my quadriceps tendon. Can you believe they're falling down in church? It was kind of, I said, how does this happen? But I said, no, I'm not going under. Uh, up to that point, I had never spent a day in a hospital, never had any serious problems. I said, no, I am not going. And besides, my mother and my sister were coming from India to visit me, and I had made all these plans. I was going to drive them to Disney World in, in Florida, and I knew if I had surgery, I would be out of commission for seven, eight weeks. I said, I can't do that. So I want another orthopedic surgeon who can give me a second opinion. So I found one who was also a parishioner, he had actually upgraded on uh, his sweetness. What is that? Oh, Walter Payton. Okay, so he kind of agreed with me. I don't know if he really meant it. He said, okay, Father, let us try physical therapy. So I hobbled around. My mother came. I drove her to Florida. But it was not easy. And then my mom and my sister went back. Then I had to go to Rome for a visit, and I went to Rome. If you have been to Rome, even with good legs, it is so difficult to get around. With a knee like that, it was a torture. So I came back and I told my surgeon, all right, I'm ready for surgery. Let's do the surgery. So he said, you need to get approval from your primary care physician. He was another parishioner. So I went to him. I took all the papers. I said, please sign, because I got to get surgery in two days. He said, looked at my EKG and said, Father, I don't think you should get the surgery. I need to check something out. I said, what do you mean? I'm, I'm a healthy guy. 
says, no, no, there is an anomaly in your EKG. So one thing led to the other. I had an angiogram. I had all sorts of stuff. And then I was sitting in front of a cardiologist. Again, another person. And I call his office. They say, oh, there are no appointments open for another two months. I called him at home. In 10 minutes, they called me back. <laughs> As a priest, we have a few perks, OK? Anyway, I got an appointment in a couple of days. There I am sitting in front of this tall, wonderful doctor. He looks at me and says, Father Prado, every Saturday, I come to Mass. I hear your homilies. But today, I have to tell you, God wanted you to fall down. I said, what do you mean? He said, Father, there are people with your heart condition. They never discovered it. Because you fell down, we have found it out. Now we can treat you with medication, and you'll be fine. I've been on the medication for 17 years now. You know? Now, was that a coincidence? A lot of people will say, oh, that was a coincidence. Think about it. I was not supposed to celebrate that mass. Usually, I never stand up there. I stand down here. That day, something said to me to do that. Imagine, just before that, I'd come from Rome. If I'd stayed in Rome, would I have found it out? No. I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God incidences. But only God incidences. OK, let me tell you a couple more stories. When I was growing up in India, as a little boy, my favorite subject was, one of my favorite subjects was geography. Why? Because I love to study about other countries, other peoples. Never imagined I'd spend the majority of my life outside of my country. Never imagined that. And when I studied about America, one of the places that intrigued me, fascinated me, was Yellowstone. I've always wanted to see the old faithful. You know? You call it the geyser, right? Now, we learned English from the British. You know what they call it? A geyser. <laughs> I tell people something as old as that should be called a geyser. <laughs> anyway, I always wanted to see that. Even though I had stayed here for 10 years almost during my graduate work, never got a chance to go to Yellowstone. So the year after I went to Rome, came back, and I have a friend whose parents live in Bozeman in Montana. So I decided to take a road trip one summer. That was 1996. I was supposed to leave on the 6th, I think, of July 1996. So, you know, at that time I was a religious priest. You don't have a lot of money. You know, it's vow of poverty and all. So I rented a small car. It was a Toyota Corolla, you know. In those days, Toyota Corolla was much smaller. Now it has become big, just with our size, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I booked a Toyota Corolla. The night before, it was the 5th of July, I knelt down to say my night prayers. And I said to the Lord, I said, you know, Lord, I have to tell you, I know tomorrow I'm starting this big road trip, like 1,400 miles. But you know, Toyota Corolla is a nice car. It's fuel efficient, but it's a little car. It's not very comfortable. How about giving me a free upgrade? <laughs> <laughs> I said that, and I went to bed. Next day, I went to Willard Airport, which is the airport in Champaign, to pick up my car. So I go there. On the board are all these rental agreements. And there is one with my name on it, and next to it is a key to a Toyota Corolla. I said, Lord, you didn't do anything. <laughs> and then the girl there asked me for my credit card, for my license. She rang up everything. And then she was literally handing me the key to the car. At that time, she asked me, hey, do you, want, do you need music in your car? I said, I'm driving 1,400 miles. Please give me a car with the stereo, please. In those days, you know, the stereo or whatever it was not there in every car. You know that. So I said, please give me. She said to me, I only want Toyota Corolla. It doesn't even have a radio. She said, I have to give you a free upgrade. <laughs> she gave me a new Ford Taurus, <laughs> olive green with 60 miles on it. I still have the rental agreement somewhere. <laughs> Coincidence? Nope. God incidents. Give one more story. When I lived in Champagne, there was a gentleman who worked for IBM. He had four children, and because of his work, he had to travel all the time. And his poor wife was always stuck with the kids, and he would go off. So he felt bad for his wife, and so he decided to give her a holiday after Christmas. 
So he had the children, and the wife was gone to Hawaii. And of course, two days after Christmas, he wanted to plan for his next trip. So he goes to the travel agent, gets his ticket, and he has a couple of the kids with him. So as he's putting the children in the car seats, he puts the ticket on the top of his car, forgets about it, drives off. Comes home, after a couple of hours, he says, where did I put the ticket? He searches the whole house, goes back to his office, searches the office, it's not there. Then only he remembers, maybe I lost it on the way, so he retraces his steps, he can't find it. The travel agent says, no, this was 1990-something, uh, 93, 94. Uh, anyway, the travel agent says, we can't issue another ticket because somebody else could use the ticket, so he said, oh, what do I do? It was about $600. You know, his wife would be upset with him, but anyway, so he was a little bit worried. The next day, there was a terrible snowstorm in, in Champagne. The snow plows were out, and uh, any hope of finding the ticket was gone. The day after the snowstorm, the children wanted to go to McDonald's. You'll be surprised how God even uses fast food. <laughs> so normally he would take one road to go to McDonald's. That is something said to him to go another way. And he's driving along. Something on a snow pile to the right catches his eye. So he stops the car, goes and checks it out. It was his ticket. I'm not making this up. I asked him to write the story, give it to me. I have it with me, as he wrote the story. Coincidence. No, that is. What do these things mean? This is what I believe. You know, there is a saying, we like someone because we love someone although. You know, we like someone because we love someone although. God loves us although. And he's the one who loved us first. The very fact we have existence is because this God fell in love with us. And because he fell in love with us, even after creating us, he showers his gifts on us to get our attention, to make us convinced how much he is in love with us. But we don't get it. So what does he do? He wants to hit us on the head with the two by four. Those are what I call the garden spaces. He says, can you pay attention? How much I'm in love with you. And we don't get it. And why is that? I think it is because when we, I mean, this realization only comes when you're an adult, not when you're children. You have to have a certain amount of life experience. So what happens is when we reach adulthood, all of us have had our share of pain, of suffering, of rejection, of hurt, of loss, tragedy, we all had that. So what happens is we are more caught up with the pain and we lose sight of the love. Have you ever seen somebody with a toothache? It's a small thing, but the whole world stinks. Am I right? We don't, we don't notice that. But what the Lord is saying is that even in the bad times, even something awful happens, this God is still in love with us. If only we can understand that he's in love with us, even in the tragedy, we will see things differently. I can, I can give you an example. You know, I said that my mother came here in 2000. And she went back. And I visited her in 2001. In 2002, I was supposed to visit her in November. But my mother died suddenly in July. And it was a Sunday night. I was in my in bed. I get a call from one of my brothers. So they broke the news to me. You know, it was very hard. And uh, I made my travel arrangements on Monday morning. I left Monday evening. And I reached there Wednesday morning. That is their time. It would be Tuesday evening here. So I reached home at 6. Of course, in India, still we, you know, the person dies. They are laid out in the living room, not in the funeral home. So I went home. You know, saw my mom. In, uh, in four hours, I had to celebrate the funeral mass. So I was celebrating the funeral mass. It was like me watching a movie of me celebrating mass. It was surreal. And I couldn't even talk, so I asked one of my Jesuit friends to give the homily. 
And then, when the funeral was over, I was at home for another week with my siblings. You know, it is a very strange feeling. You know, when you lose both your parents, you suddenly feel you're an orphan. It's really when you're a priest, it's even more. Because at least you have family. Me, you know, it's, it's a very strange feeling. I felt so... So I was coming back. There was a long flight. I kept fighting with God. I said, Lord, you have a lousy sense of time. I said, I was supposed to see my mom in November. Why did you take her in July? Wouldn't you have given me one more chance to hug her? You know, my mother never asked for anything for herself. But one thing I you know, kept asking, what do you want, what do you want? Finally, she said, OK, get me Yardley's Roses Body Powder, <laughs> something she liked. And of course, I couldn't find it here. Somebody went to London, so they got it for me. I could not even give it to her. So I was very upset with God, and I kept fighting with him. And then, about two months later, I was celebrating Mass in a nursing home. And uh, they were all sitting in a semicircle, and I was here with the altar. And during the reading, I was looking at the people. There were about 20 people there. Out of that, only four were not in wheelchairs. And of the rest, only a couple of people had any clue at all as to what was going on. And as I looked at them, something hit me. And I looked up and I said, OK, I get it now. Thank you. Because right then, I remembered that my mother used to say two prayers. Prayer number one, that none of her children should die before her. She said, there is no sorrow deeper for a mother than to bury a child. And the second was that she should not be a burden to her children. Because my grandmother, my mother's mother, was bedridden for the last six years of her life. My mom, my aunts, my uncles, my siblings, they all took care of her. My mom had been very active. She came to America four times. The only place she wanted me to take her to was Lourdes, and I did. She had seen all her grandchildren. She lived a full life. She was a very active woman. It would have been very hard for her to be like bedridden or something. So God took her. It was good for her, not for me. Just then I remember the words of Paul in the letter to the Romans. Chapter 8, verse 20. Everything works unto good for those who love God. So even in bad times, even in tragedy and pain, this God doesn't forget his love for us. I'll tell you one more story. This is not from my life, but somebody else's life. This is from a book by a, a guy called Rushnell. It's called God Wings. And he narrates the story in that book. He talks about a young woman, her name was Beth. She lived in New Orleans, but she was originally from the East Coast. And her dad, who was in his 50s, was having heart trouble. And they were looking for a heart transplant. They could not find a match. Finally, they got one. So she was very excited, went home, was with her father for the surgery. The surgery went well. He seemed to be doing well. So she came home to New Orleans. But a few days later, he developed complications and he dies. She's very upset. Early in the morning, she's sitting at New Orleans airport waiting to catch a plane. There's hardly anybody there except one guy in a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt reading a paper in one corner of the waiting area. So she's sitting there all by herself crying. And suddenly she realizes somebody is standing over her. She looks up. It is that guy in the blue jeans and t-shirt. She looks at him, he looks oddly familiar. Then really she realizes it is Kevin Costner, the actor. So he looks at her and says, what is wrong? So he, she tells him the story. He sits by her side, listens to her story, consoles her, comforts her. In the meantime, his guys come and tell him that his private plane is ready for boarding. He says, no, I, I'm not going to leave yet. I want to see her get on her plane. He sits with her. And then he tells her, you know, that he was in New Orleans to check out sites for shooting the movie JFK. And he said that he would be back in a couple of months, and if she ever wanted to see our movies, may come and see me, I'll be there. With that, she goes to catch her plane, and she's walking to the gate. He looks at her and says, Beth, please tell your mother 
how sorry I am for her loss. And then he says, Beth, remember, good things come out of bad times. With that, she leaves. Finishes the funeral, comes home. After a couple of months, she has to mail a letter in a post office, some documents in a post office. So she has to drive across town. She has to go through what is called the Lafitte Park. And as she's going through there, she sees a lot of trucks, a lot of commotion. She's a little curious. So after mailing the letter on her way back, she didn't have much to do that afternoon. So she stops and asks around. And the people tell her that um, Kevin Costner was shooting a movie, JFK. So she calls the security guy and tells him, the girl who was crying at the airport a couple of months ago is here to see Mr. Costner. <laughs> so he goes and tell, uh, tells Costner, he comes over. He takes her around for about 10, 15 minutes. Then he says, well, I got a movie to shoot, but I'm going to leave you in the hands of my assistant, a young man. His name was Roger. Later that night, Beth tells her mom over the phone, Mom, I met the guy I'm going to marry. <laughs> <laughs> he took her around. They dated. She moved to LA. They got married. They had a baby. And it was not only good for her, also for him. Because when he graduated from college, immediately got this job with a movie company, but he always <coughs> wanted to be an entertainment lawyer. So she put him through law school so that he can be an entertainment lawyer. One little piece of the puzzle. You know? Unfortunately, we don't realize that. See, what I'm telling you is not anything extraordinary, but it is extraordinary. But it's very simple. Because we go through life thinking that I have to win God's love. I have, not that we shouldn't be perfect, but we put the horse, uh, cart before the horse. Do you know what I mean? We are good because this God has loved us, not the other way around. Because, see, when we look at our relationship with God as children to the parent, how do we react to our parents? Always approval. No matter if we are 70 years old, we are still thinking in those terms. But the, the Lord wants us to move to what I call divine romance. Is God not only loves us, He's in love with us. He loves us no matter what. Now what is the greatest love in our life? For me, it's the mother's love, right? It's the greatest love in our life. And what does the Lord say in the scriptures? We heard that scripture just a couple of Sundays ago. Can a woman forget a child? Or a mother forget a baby? Even if these forget, I will not forget you. Because I have I've tattooed your name on the palm of my hand. You're always before me. See, this is the God's love. Unfortunately, we don't get that message. We don't get that message. I hope you are with me so far. Not falling asleep yet, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to break the monotony. You know, I like to break monotony. So I'm going to read to you what I call this. You have heard from me, but you know, it's good too. Church bulletin bloopers. You heard these. <laughs> These are actual announcements people put in bulletins. Don't let worry kill you, let the church help. <laughs> Thursday night, potluck supper, prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> Remember in your prayers the many who are sick of our church and community. <laughs> For those of you who have children and didn't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> The rosebud on the altar this morning is to announce the birth of David Allen Belzer, the sin of Reverend and Mrs. Julius Belzer. <laughs> this afternoon there will be a meeting in the south and north ends of the church. Children will be baptized at both ends. <laughs> Tuesday at 4 p.m. there will be an ice cream social. All ladies giving milk will please come early. <laughs> Wednesday, the ladies' liturgy will meet. Mrs. Johnson will sing, Put Me in My Little Bed, accompanied by the pastor. <laughs> Thursday at 5 p.m., there will be a meeting of the Little Mothers Club. All ladies wishing to be little mothers will meet with the pastor in his study. <laughs> this being Easter Sunday, we'll ask Mrs. Lewis to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. <laughs> Bertha Belch, a missionary from Africa, will be speaking tonight at Calvary Memorial Church in Racine. Come tonight. 
and here birds are belch all the way from Africa. <laughs> Our youth basketball team is back in action Wednesday at 8 p.m. in the gym. Come out and watch us kill Christ the King. <laughs> Miss Charlene Mason sang, I will not pass this way again, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget your husbands. <laughs> the sermon this morning, Jesus walks on water. The sermon tonight, looking for Jesus. <laughs> Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. at the First Presbyterian Church. Please use large double doors at the side entrance. <laughs> and the last one at the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> You know, church is funny. I mean, people don't realize, you know? God has a sense of humor. Okay, so, so far what I've said to you is that very simple, you know, that, that we don't realize that this God not just loves us, he's in love with us. See, even a man will do the craziest things for the woman he loves. Not just loves, he's in love with, right? God does that. God is crazy. You heard the reading from Ezekiel. You know that is talk God talking to Israel. Says you are like a little baby thrown by the side of the road, abandoned. You are still in your blood. But I picked you up. I washed you. I anointed you. And you grew up to be a young woman, ready for love. And then I clothed you. I gave you beautiful jewelry. Fed you the finest food. You were the most beautiful in all the land. And of course, if you continue reading, you will say, hey, you know, I married you, but you ran after other lovers. You forgot me. So this is not just addressed to Israel. I think it is addressed to all of us. If you look at the great saints, that was their secret. Teresa of Avila. If you go to the church Saint Susanna in Rome on Via Veneto, which is near the American consulate, okay? It is the American church it is. You know, that's where they have English masses and all. Saint Su Susanna. There is a beautiful painting of Caravaggio. What is it? The ecstasy of Teresa. You know, she was so much in love with the Lord, she would go into ecstasy, just contemplating. She's holding a cross. Just contemplating the love of the Lord, she goes into ecstasy. You know, the great saints, this is a secret of holiness, that when you realize that this God is in love with you, it changes everything. You know? Let me give you maybe a, a, a paint you a picture. You know, a young man walks into a park. It's a beautiful park with flowers and, and bushes and trees and everything is in bloom. It's a summer day. There's a gentle breeze blowing. There's this young woman sitting there reading a book. And her hair is flow, you know, flowing in the wind like a Pantene commercial. <laughs> and the young man takes one look at her and he's smitten. And he says, ah, I want to. I want her to fall in love with me. So he tries every trick in the book. He tries to talk to her. He tries to, you know, uh, try to reach out to her, sends her little notes and flowers and gifts. Of course, in this country, you'll put a restraining order, but let's not do that for the sake of the story. Okay, she many times refuses the gifts and the notes. Sometimes she takes the chocolate, eats the chocolate, but she doesn't want to read the, read the note. Then one day in an unusual moment of weakness and vulnerability, she opens a card and she reads and recognizes the handwriting. Then she says, oh, it was that guy. All along it was he. So she lets herself fall in love. It's the same thing with us. No, God would not have created us if he didn't fall in love with the very idea of me before I existed. Book of Jeremiah. I knew you before you were born, I formed you in your mother's womb. This is the truth. I like to picture like this, you know? God lines up all human beings, present, past, future, actual, probable, past, uh, you know, all the people. And then God comes down the line one by one. And he came to you, he stopped, looked you in the eye, 
And he said, you are wonderful, you are beautiful, you are so lovable. You are going to make a tremendous impact on my children, on my world. So I love you, I want you to exist. It is a deliberate decision on the part of God to give us life. And after having done that, he showers us with gifts. Everything, our intelligence, our beauty, our smarts, whatever talents we have, the family we have, the temperament, wherever we were born, you know, but we take all that for granted. We say, I deserve it, this is mine, you know, I work for it, and no. When you realize that we have been loved, that this God has showered everything on me, even though I don't deserve any of it, when you come to that realization, then you fall in love with it. Instead, what we do, oh, it is mine. You know, it is like this Irish guy who had to, who had to attend a business meeting in Manhattan. So he's driving around trying to find a parking spot. He goes around the block three times, he can't find a spot. He's getting nervous because in another 10 minutes, the meeting is starting. He hasn't been to church in three years, so he starts to pray. He says, Lord, I know, I haven't been to church, but I promise you I'll go back to church. Please give me a spot. All right, all right, I'm not being nice to the missus, but I'll be gentle to her. Also, I know I drink too much. Okay, I'll, I'll cut down on that. Yes, I haven't been to church also. Okay, okay, I'll pray. Okay, and my children, yes, I'll be nicer to them. And as he is saying, somebody pulls out of the parking lot. He says, Lord, forget what I said. I found a spot. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? This is what we do. We don't realize that everything has been given. It's a gift. See, I, I jokingly say, pardon my apologies to the gentlemen in the audience, most men, I think, marry beyond their league, out of their league. When a man is, you know, when a man is conscious of that, the marriage is beautiful. You know that? When he is so grateful to the woman, because she loved him. The marriage is beautiful. It's the same thing with God. Now when you realize that this God has been so good to me, I can tell you, when I was a young guy, seminarian priest, oh, you know, I've sacrificed this, I gave up this, Lord, you know, oh, like Peter asks in the gospel, Lord, we left everything, what do we have? <laughs> this is the attitude. The opposite attitude is what is right. When I get older, I look at everything and say, God, how the heck did I land here? Standing in front of you, a little boy running around in a city in India, southern India, never imagined God would take you somewhere. You know? So that is the sense. This God is in love with you. And when somebody is in love with you, you know what they do? They work for your maximum benefit. So I really believe this, that God orchestrates everything for our maximum benefit. And how does that happen? So let me go back to my story to to Old Faithful in uh, Yellowstone. So I reached Montana, Bozeman. Two days later, we went to Yellowstone. Now, from Bozeman to go to Yellowstone, it's quite a ride. And so by the time we reached the place where all the geysers are, it was almost like noon or a little later. Of course, the first thing we do, we have lunch. And my good American friends, where do they go immediately? They go to the gift shop. <laughs> so we are browsing through the souvenir shop, then I, they had posted the times when the, the geyser would be active. So I looked there, it says like two o'clock or something. I look at my watch, it's 10 past two. So I said to my friends, hey guys, we came all the way, we missed it. The next time it's going to be active again, it's another hour or two. Oh, I said, oh, good mystery. So my friends said, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. Even though, you know, Old Faithful takes Metamucil, it is not always regular. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we looked there, the people were still waiting. It was 10 minutes late, so we ran over there. And in another couple of minutes, it started to act up. It spewed out water and steam that rose about 20 feet and then fizzled. People said, sometimes this happens. I said, not today, because I'm here. <laughs> and we waited. In another couple of minutes, it put up this magnificent display of water and steam that rose up 200 feet in the air. And I have a picture. And I looked up at the sky and said, Lord, thank you. Thank you for dis uh, delaying the show for me. <laughs> and I meant it. I really believe. Now, you've got to believe that. 
this God works for your maximum benefit. See, it's like when you go to a movie, you know what happens when you go to a movie? The movie tells the story of the main protagonist, right? For example, one of the most popular movie was, movies was Titanic. Now that whole movie was about that one woman, Rose, right? Her travel to America. And everybody else in that story is dispensable. Even Leonardo DiCaprio, who dies at the end. It is her story. Even the sinking of the Titanic is narrated against her life. In the same way, when you look at God's love for you, God's romance with you, He orchestrates everything for your maximum benefit. There are days, you know, you drive somewhere, you're looking for a parking spot, and some spot opens up for you. Now what we say, ah, coincidence. Not only that, with money, uh, the meter is still running. Has it happened to you? <laughs> for example, before we got that British lady in the GPS in our cars, you know, it has happened to me. I was driving somewhere to Atlanta, somebody to visit somebody years ago. It was night, and we were worried. Those days we didn't have cell phones, we had to go to a pay phone and call somebody. They said, oh, you're in the next block. Or you're thinking of somebody, a friend you haven't talked to in ages. They send you a letter or they call you. Has it happened? He dismiss all these things. This God is always working. Do you know that myself coming to America, to, to St. Paul, how did that happen? I believe in these things. I mean, this is God's work. You know, I didn't even know St. Paul of the Cross existed. Because I always lived in Barrington, which was far away. You know, not just, uh, you know, just far away on, the, on that side of the diocese. <laughs> the times I've been on the train, I've seen this beautiful church. I wondered what church it was. Until I was sent to Evanston, and then one of the parishioners here, I did a wedding in Barrington. I, I baptized their two children in Old St. Pat's. Then they moved here. So the next child, they asked me to come and baptize here. So I came here for the baptism. They had finished the regular baptisms. There were so many people in the church, and there was so much energy. And I walked into the church, looked at our beautiful church, and I remember a thought growing through my head. Wouldn't it be beautiful if I could be here? I never said, Lord, send me here. I thought, then what happens? A few months later, I get a call from one of our pastoral associates, Kelly Hoyts, because they had booked somebody to do the parish mission. And the last minute that gentleman pulled out, he wasn't, wasn't coming. So they were stuck. So she calls the Holy Name Cathedral for some names of people who do these things. She had like eight names, and I was one of those names. She calls me first. And then I had these days open. I come here, I get to know this parish. And so when I was ready to come, I said, okay, I'm going to apply for this parish. And I wouldn't have been able to come if but the call had gone away at the time that usually it goes away because he finished his 12 years. And because of the little turmoil you had with the, with the pads thing, he asked the archdiocese for one extra year. If he hadn't stayed for that one extra year, I wouldn't be here. Think about it. And then when I came here, you know, there's another story. I'm mean, just telling you that because this is not only really happens to me, it happens to all of us. You just have to open your eyes. The day I, they announced me as pastor, Father Carl called me and said, we're going to come over and see the campus. So I introduced to the staff. So I came over, he took me around, then finally he said, let's go up to your room. So he wanted to show me where I would be living. So we, in the rectory, we are going up the stairs. And as I'm going up the stairs, I look to the left wall, there is a picture. I did a double take, because it's a picture of our Blessed Mother sitting on the floor with the little baby Jesus on her on her lap, and Jesus is playing with all these pigeons and doves. Now, I've been in Europe for several years, I've visited many museums, I've never seen that painting anywhere except in one other place. You know where? It was in our living room when I was growing up as a child. <laughs> and that picture is there. You can come into the picture, I'll show you the picture. God was telling me you're home. See? Now, You've all seen those little, you know, uh, puzzle things, like pieces of wood put together in a jumble of pieces, and you stare at it, suddenly it spells Jesus. 
Have you seen those things? But once you have seen it, you will always see it. Once you become aware of how this God has been in love with you, you will keep seeing it over and over again. He will speak to you even through ordinary things. Everywhere you will find God's presence. So this is my simple message. So what do you got to do? When you go home, I want you to reflect quietly and think about your life. Go as far back as you can possibly go. Think of every gift you have received in your life, whether it be your personality or your family or your smarts. Or Think of the times that when you were in a difficult place and you never thought you would get out of it, and God finds a way. The right person shows up, right? Now, those of us living here in Chicago, how many close calls we have had in our life? Driving, right? How many? We dismiss those things. I have had a couple of close calls. You know, 2006, December, I was driving to Springfield to give talks to the priest there. I have a friend who lived in Peoria, in Morton. So I decided to stay with him for the night. I was near uh, Veterans Parkway in Bloomington, you know, where the Veterans Parkway goes off. And the previous night I had not slept very well, and I left here about 3 o'clock. The sun is beating down on me. And I told myself, maybe I shouldn't be driving. But I said, oh, it's OK. I'll be drinking coffee and Coke. And, and then when I was there near Veterans Parkway, I nodded off. And I set my car on cruise control at 70 miles an hour. My car moved from the right lane to the left lane, went to the shoulder. I heard that noise, you know, when the tire hits those rough spots. And I said to myself, oh, don't wake me up. I'm having a nice sleep. Then I said, oh, Lord, I'm driving. <laughs> and I woke up and I cussed, held on to the steering wheel. The car went into the median. It made a 180 degree turn, faced the other side of the highway, about six feet short of the highway. I stopped. Then I got out and started hyperventilating. Then I pulled over to the other side of the thing, got out of the exit, came back and went back, drove to, but I was shaking for the next couple of hours. A few months later, I was on the same highway, and I more or less knew where I had gone off the road. I was watching. You know what I discovered? If I had nodded off 20 seconds earlier, or 20 seconds later, I would have hit a concrete barrier. So what I want to tell you, it doesn't happen only to me. It happens to all of us. There are no exceptions. The only thing we are not aware. So just, I would like to invite you to reflect. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, to inspire you, to enlighten you. OK? So this is what you're going to do. So walk down memory lane and find out how this God has shown you. Especially try to discover what I call the God incidences in your life. You do have those God incidences. Now, I was preaching this mission in, uh, in Queen of All Saints last week. <laughs> this elderly lady who comes in a wheelchair, she's pushed by her caretaker. She, was, she had a beautiful hat, you know. The second day, as she was going out, her hat flew off in the wind. She couldn't find it. And she is really sad that, you know, it's gone, I can't find it. They search for it everywhere. They ask the lost and found nothing. The next day she comes for the talk, she enters the church, it is sitting on the table. Somebody had found it and put it there. You know? I mean, little things. But see, but once you see it, you will see it everywhere. And your life changes. Even when things go wrong, you know this God is still in love with you. And you say, Lord, you know. I don't get it. It's painful. I fight with you. But still, it's okay. So for me, this is the starting point of our spiritual life. Too many times what we do is we think, you know, oh, I have to do this and do that so that God will love me more. No, 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 God loves you. It's a given. He doesn't take it away. But because he loves us, we want to be better. We want to be holier. We want to do this or that because we've been loved. And this is what Paul says in his letter, you know. He says, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So, the last point I'll make, all right? Anyway, yeah, we are still on time. Um, you know, there was a, 
the winter this year has been very mild, right? But there was, a, it seems one year that the winter was terrible. And there was this couple living in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And they decided to take a little break, go to a warmer place. So they were going to Florida for a break. This was years ago, where internet was not that common and all that. So the husband, of course, had to do a business trip to New York. So on Thursday night, he was going to reach Florida. And on Friday, the wife was supposed to join him in Florida. So when the gentleman reaches Florida, the hotel, in the lobby, he found a computer with access to internet. So he decided to send an email to his wife, telling her that he reached. So, so he sits down to write an email, and as he's writing his, her email address, he makes one little spelling mistake. So instead of the message going to her, it goes to a, a widow who had just buried her husband, who was a preacher for 42 years in Texas. So this widow comes home after the funeral, and she sits down at the computer to check email messages that people must have sent in condolence. She opens the first email and she passes out. Her son comes and looks at the screen and this is what it says. To my loving wife. Subject, I have arrived. <laughs> my darling wife, I just want to inform you that I arrived here safely. You will be surprised to know that because nowadays they have computers up here. <laughs> I want to let you know that my journey was very pleasant and uneventful. But also you should know that preparations are being made for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> I hope your journey will be as uneventful as mine was. Your loving husband. P.S. It is really hot down here. <laughs> Okay, so, now, I said that God loves us romantically. You know, we, we, we have never been taught to think that way, but that is the way we got to think. This God is in love with me. So what is romantic love? I go to psychologists for this. A psychologist by name Robert Sternberg gives that there are three elements for what we call romantic love or consummate love. Intimacy, commitment, passion. What is intimacy? Intimacy is the degree of um, knowledge you have of the other person. Now, the extent to which you are ready to open your heart and your soul to the other, and how willing you are to receive the self-disclosure of the other. How much at home you feel with the other person. It is the readiness to communicate at more than the superficial level. That is intimacy. Second is commitment. Commitment is recognizing that this relationship is so precious and so important that you are ready to work on it to the exclusion of all other relationships and that you are ready to invest in it for the long term, making any sacrifice, any compromise you need to make. Number two. Number three, passion is the fire, the spark in the relationship. Is the excitement you feel when you're going to be with this person. It is a sense of loss you feel when you're away from this person. The erotic element is part of it. It's not the whole of it. It's the capacity to dream dreams together. Now, when God loves us, he knows us thoroughly, he's totally committed to us, and also he's passionate about us. How about our relationship with the Lord? Think about it. A lot of people, I think, go by commitment. Just imagine if your marriage were only based on commitment. I made the vows, so I'm going to do this for you. Imagine if your husband, those of you women here, your husband says, honey, I know that I'm supposed to talk to you. I have 10 minutes. Let's talk. What do you say? Get away from me. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And yet with God, our relationship has become a series of prescriptions and more proscriptions. You know, do this or don't do this. And in our lives it is more don't do this. That is not the way to relate to the Lord. Commitment is important. But you need intimacy to know the Lord. How do you get to know the Lord? That is what you call prayer. Where you sit and spend time with the Lord. When we have this beautiful thing called adoration chapel. You know, sometimes just being there. You may not have great ideas or 
great revelation. It doesn't matter. It's just being in His presence. Or wherever you are, to be in touch with this God, to listen. So tomorrow we'll talk about prayer. Again, from the idea of romance. How we relate to God, how we pray. You know? And then the passion. Where have you found the passion? You know, even those of us priests, when we preach to you, where is the excitement about God? Or we say, oh, God loves us. Uh -uh. There is more passion in those people selling the lip gloss doesn't, that doesn't stick to the wine glass. <laughs> and we are excited. We're not excited about eternal life, right? We're not excited about the Eucharist. We have the greatest treasures. So where is the passion? So what we need to do in our life, in our relationship with the Lord, not only the commitment that is doing all what we are supposed to do, but it is about getting to know the Lord, to be able to hear His voice, to be able to go where He takes us, and also to feel that excitement about God. Now when you see the saints, I mean, what great excitement they had about God. Ignatius of Loyola said, everything for the greater glory of God. Mother Teresa, the woman who couldn't even feel the presence of God for the last several years of her life. And yet, she was in love with her spouse. You know? Now, there's a beautiful book in the Bible, which most of us never have seen it, never read it, don't even know that it exists. It's called the Song of Songs, which is a small little book in the Old Testament. You know, it is, it is nothing but earthy, graphic, passionate love poetry. It expresses the physical longings and yearnings of the beloved for the lover and the lover for the beloved. And many mystic writers have seen that as this romance between God and the soul and the person. In fact, St. Bernard, who was a great devotee of the Blessed Mother, uses that book as a model for the relationship of our Blessed Mother with, with the Trinity. That she is the beloved. You know? So I believe this is the image that we've got to hold on to. And once you look at your spiritual life like that, you know, you have joy. And that's what I'm going to talk about on the third day. Have you ever seen anybody who's in love miserable? No. Only when that love goes south, then it is miserable. But when you're really in love, and this God never is always faithful. He only walk away, but he doesn't. So, that is what I want to leave with you. So I'm going to finish with a final quote. This is from a, another great saint. You have heard his name? Augustine. You know his story, right? He was a brilliant man. By the age of 16, he had established a school of rhetoric in Carthage in North Africa. And, uh, but by the age of 18, he had fathered a child out of wedlock. And what did he call the child? Deodatus, given by God. <laughs> he had trouble all his life with flesh, temptations of the flesh. Until the age of 33. He struggled so much that in his own spiritual autobiography called The Confessions, he says, God, give me chastity, eh, but not yet. <laughs> he wasn't ready to give that up. So at the age of 33, under the influence of another great saint, Saint Ambrose of Milan, he converts. And what a saint he became. And his own relationship with the Lord, you know, is all spelled out in his spiritual memoirs called The Confessions. And here he writes these words to God. Listen to this. This is a, is a lover talking to the lover, or the beloved talking to the lover. Late have I loved you, O beauty, ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. And behold, you are within, and I without. And without I sought you. And deformed I ran after these forms of beauty you have made. You are with me, and I was not with you. Those things held me back from you. Things whose only being was to be in you. You called, you cried, and you broke through my deafness. You blazed, you shone, and you chased away my blindness. You became fragrant, and I inhaled and sighed for you. I tasted, and now hunger and thirst for you. You touched me, and I burned for your embrace. This is a saint. Maybe we can say those words in our life when we talk to the Lord. So, simple message, God not only loves you, is in love with you. God bless you.
Thank you, Father Brito, for an inspirational kickoff to our Lent commission. Please come back tomorrow. Our session tomorrow, as Father Brito said, is about prayer, getting in touch with the God within.